We are Heather and Paul Christie. And for over 12 years, we've worked with executives and entrepreneurs to accelerate change in every aspect of their business. Because we are in the fastest paced business environment that anyone has ever seen before. So join us for the Evolve to Win Show. Hey, thanks for tuning in to the Evolve to Win Show with Heather and Paul. Again today, I have Theo Etzel with me. Welcome back, Theo. Thank you, Heather. And this is part two of my interview with Theo. And we just, we couldn't possibly get done in a short period of time what we <laughs> had to get done. And what's really interesting is as of the airing of this episode, um, Theo has gone from CEO and chairman of the board to now just chairman of the board because Correct. he has hit a major, major milestone in his career right. when he's been able to pass that CEO hat to his former president and COO, who's now acting as CEO. Correct. Yeah, Absolutely. super, super fun. Yeah, we're so, very happy about that, proud of him and, and uh, all his accomplishments and, absolutely. and everything. So he's earned it. Yeah, oh my so. gosh, I can't wait to hear more about how you created that su succession plan. And what we're going to go through today really is going to be uh, something that entrepreneurs and those who are maybe next in line to become CEO are really going to want to listen to because we're going through a couple of different things. First of all, we're going to talk a little bit about recapitalization and we'll explain what that is in a moment. Um, but then we're also going to talk about the process that Theo has gone through with his team over the past five or so years really in preparation for this succession. So if you are currently the business owner or managing partner um, or among a number of partners and you're looking to retire out, this is an unbelievable episode for you to tune into. Now in part one of my interview with Theo, we talked a little bit about his book, Invest Your Heart Beats Wisely. And he shared with us a little bit about the fact that we only have a limited number of heartbeats and we're trading these heartbeats for the dollars that we work for. Um, he also talked a bit about the culture of his organization and the intentionality behind that culture. Talked mm -hmm. about the trust that he worked to build in order to get this company going, um, which is all really based in a foundation of integrity. And one of the coolest things uh, that I really liked about our first conversation is when you talked about when you walk in the door as the leader of the company, it's showtime and you're on. Showtime. So right now, Theo, it's showtime. It's showtime. <laughs> Let's go. I want to I want to jump straight to this recapitalization. Okay. And for those who are listening out there who are not familiar with that mm -hmm. terminology, uh, share with them what is the recapitalization all about. So a recapitalization of a company is a a financing term or another way to uh, take some of your, typically take some of your uh, shares or some of your coins that you have invested in your company and maybe you're, you have partners and some of their coins and basically you sell a portion of that, uh, that company. You can also recap through debt, but that is uh, harder today, I would say, for many smaller companies just because banks are not as uh, willing to step out on a limb and 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 do more debt financing that way, but mm -hmm. typically you get an investor that wants to be involved, you know, another partner that wants to be involved in the company. Uh, you uh, have a market price for that company that can be done through an appraisal, it can be done through com comparables and 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 other things, but you have a market price, and you sell some portion, majority, minority portion of those shares of that partnership or that uh, stock uh, holder and you're able to then extract some some coins out of that mm -hmm. uh, obviously a full recapitalization you get to exit so somebody wants to come in and, and and we talk in terms of a financial partner or we talk in terms of a strategic partner mm -hmm. so a strategic would be somebody in the line of business that you're in and may just want to absorb you Mm -hmm. and take over and they have people that are going to run it or they're going to meld it in, merge it in with their operation and they don't need all the people there. That's one form. Mm -hmm. uh, the other form, the one we, we took, we took on a financial partner to help us grow, okay. uh, continue to grow. And, and one of the reasons for that is because we had some older uh, people involved in the company as shareholders. Mm -hmm. and, and truthfully, 
to grow again, we were going to, you know, that's sort of more uh, at risk dollars or a little riskier dollars going in the, in the forward mode of, of growth, you know, potentially acquisitions and expansion into new territories and things like that has a longer horizon than they probably wanted to see. Okay. And so it was, it behooved us to go out in the marketplace and find a financial partner. And we found a a private equity firm that was a boutique private equity firm. Uh, uh, and, and they did not, they do not run anything. So they wanted, they bet on the team. Got it. They Got bet it. on the team and the concept, you know, what you're doing, how you're doing it, your performance, all those things matter, but they bet on the team. And so, uh, they stepped in and, 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 we, we got to take some coins off the table. Some of the older partners got to cash out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we, we formed and, you know, just kept on going. I mean, everybody that was on our team stayed on our team and we just moved forward. Okay. So, so, so just to recap, you had, you had some shareholders who were ready to cash out to some or all of their investment. Right. And you're also looking to bring cash into the company Correct. because, because this is basically an event where you're looking at a growth strategy and you know that you want to have additional capital in the company because you're going to have some larger areas of risk, right? Including acquisitions or mergers correct. or whatever's on the whatever's, horizon, yeah, whatever's right? on your horizon. That's um, and so, so this is a very strategic move for a couple of reasons. First is the opportunity to buy out these shareholders without maybe the cash coming out of your pocket, right? Correct. So spreading that that risk ultimately. Um, So we're, so we're allowing some shareholders to exit. We're also bringing in this new capital, but I'm, as I'm hearing from you, you're not bringing this, this private equity firm in on the strategy side. Is that right? They're Uh, they're, they're silent. Well, no, they're not silent. They're involved in strategy, but they like the strategy we were on and they, they actually up our game because that is their, that is their uh, bread and butter of looking at metrics, of looking at uh, strategies, of looking at how do you maximize or how do you get the returns for, okay. for shareholders? What are you doing? You know, what about this? What about that? Uh, dashboards, things that, that, that really do, uh, they're, they're very good about that. This is, you know, people have uh, sometimes an, an idea of private equity hearing the bad stories, mm-hmm. right? Those are the ones that get publicized. They Come came in, in, they chop and they, they came in and, and you know, yeah. it's like, okay, we can make, we can make fun, funny numbers out of these financials by here's what we're going to do. And we're going to streamline. Well, streamline, that means half your staff goes away and, mm-hmm. and all that. Nothing changed yeah. from our operations focus. You kept 100% of your employees all of during employees, this. Yeah. All of our employees. So I think this is this is really important. And I think there are a lot of people out there who are watching who, who maybe aren't really clear on this strategy, or maybe they've been scared off from looking at this strategy because mm-hmm. they've heard some horror stories, right. right? And it doesn't have to be that way. Now, what, what you what you have to do, I mean, it's a, from, from my standpoint, when, when we looked at people, as potential partners, we're also looking for a cultural fit. Yes. So you did your homework. So you we did had a to lot do of homework. Due we had to do due diligence on that side. Now, yeah. that being said, there's a whole lot of due diligence that goes on from anybody. I don't really care who it is that's coming in. If if you're if you're trying to sell a portion of your company or sell all of your company, they're going to verify everything that that is there. You have a special so, term for that. I do. Fact. I do. I actually <laughs> Which call I it, think is awesome. Yeah, I actually call it a, a, a corporate colonoscopy because that's essentially what happens is every rock stone thing is going to be turned upside down. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you, everything is scrutinized. Everything mm-hmm. is verified. Everything is looked at. Uh, mm-hmm. Forensic accountants come in. They, they do their thing. They're testing your audits. They're looking at all the, the numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, it's important. I would say this. If you wake up in the morning one day and say, you know what? I'm tired of this. I want to sell. And you think that's going to happen soon. I would, I would say you need to back up. And you need to say, you know, three to five years before that event is sort of put on the table, you need to really get your house in order. Mm -hmm. So things like cleaning up your financial statements. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many, many owners uh, and partners of small companies 
tend to put things in the business or through the business that really don't belong in the business. Mm -hmm. And you don't want any of that stuff in there. When Easier you, to you know. get deals done when, you know, the country club dues are not in there or the boat <laughs> payment's not in there. Or the Rolex for the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. All those things. And those yeah. are owner benefits and, and people will, you know, they'll look at those and, and add them back and say, yeah, well, that'll go away. But cleaner much cleaner to have everything clean that way much cleaner you have to get your corporate books in order mm -hmm. very easy you know as you go through in your small small company to not have a shareholder meeting to not have a board meeting to right. not take minutes uh, maybe you know the registration lapsed a year or whatever go back get all those things cleaned up it takes an attorney to do that mm -hmm. but it's worth the the preemptive side of this. So get it all in order, get some things in order. That's just on the, that's just on the front that's facing just side. The clean, that's, that's like the logistical side of things, that's right? That's not the organizational side. No, right? Which so, is a bigger deal, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I believe. Yeah. Um, but you're right. And, and bringing in those professionals is yes. so, so key. I mean, as Theo said, if you're thinking about this exit, because we've, I told you, we've had a number of clients who call us and their time when I talk to them about their timeline, hey, can you come in and help us with a succession planning? We're really feeling like we need to develop some of our next generation leaders. Sure, what's your time frame? Oh, I want to be gone by January. Which right. well, if we haven't been doing this for a while, we're in trouble. But you're yeah. right on the financial side, um, having that cleaned up by a professional team, if you were to engage an attorney and an right. accounting firm uh, or sometimes an accounting firm with the legal counsel attached to it is also right. a great idea and really start start pro not only cleaning up those financials but producing the kinds of managerial financial accounting reports if right. you're not doing that right now that really help to see you know your KPIs your numbers right. that that really run the show um, such a powerful thing and have that in place for years not no. days or weeks want, before want, that company they comes trends, in right? they love so they're, trends they're data driven yeah Right, so they're data driven. Number one, right. So the very, very, very first thing, if you if you manage to get through and get a, a an LOI or a, a letter of intent, the very first thing they're going to look at are the numbers. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and they've already looked at some preliminary numbers and everything, but now they're really going to dive into the numbers because they have to make sure that those are legit. And let's be very clear: when we talk numbers, we're not talking about a PNL and a balance sheet, and, or even a statement of cash flows. We're talking about dashboards with key metrics. Everything. 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 They're going to look at files. They're going to have forensic accountants come in. They could have. Uh, they they do what typically is called a quality of earnings. So that's basically tracing dollars back. It would be mm -hmm. similar to an audit, okay. uh, a little more detailed than a standard audit. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're looking to make sure that what you say and where the dollar came from is in fact where that dollar came from. Okay. And so they're, they're going through this several weeks process. And so the, depending on your structure, if you have a CFO, the weight falls on the accounting side. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, but in our case, the second thing they wanted to look at was our reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, our culture, okay. uh, our policies and procedures for our employees, mm -hmm. and to make sure that those were in line with their philosophy. Okay. So in our case, those philosophies worked out, uh, and they were they were they meshed very well. Okay. And so, uh, you know, we we actually closed on a Friday and we're doing normal business over the weekend and Monday and it, it was sort of a large non-event. Everybody was happy and we just had a new partner in and that was it. And so we just were off to the races and we kept going. So, so it was a very, it's, it's a tedious process mm -hmm. and while you're in the process, mm -hmm. but when you, when you, um, uh, uh, get over the get over the the goal line, uh, it's a great feeling. And, and then you've, you've taken care of your, your owners that have been with you a long time, they were, they were investors and, and, you know, they, they have a payoff and, and that's mm -hmm. great. But I do think that entrepreneurs a lot of times don't start or don't sort of approach things with the end in mind. Right. And how, how do you get yourself out mm -hmm. at the end? And this is really about being strategic about the exit because most oftentimes when we're approached by owners that are looking to exit, mm -hmm. they're talking about selling their company to their employees or right. 
or getting their children involved, their adult children, who, by the way, most of the time don't really want the company, um, which becomes a major challenge, right? right? Or they have a completely different philosophy and they want to run it completely different from how mom or dad ran the company. Sure. So, um, so really understanding as, as a piece of this, if you're looking at your exit strategy, do, it, do you want your eg- exit strategy to be do you want to hold paper? Do you want to be the bank? Sure. Because if you're selling to your employees, there's a really good chance that they have not earned the kind of income that allows them to actually buy you out. So now you become the bank and you're holding a big note, a really big valuable note that sure. may or may not get paid, um, which is very different from what you've just done a couple right. of years ago. Right. Um, now, I want to go back and just ask a couple questions about mm-hmm. how you found the right firm. I know that you were looking for a cultural fit, yes. as, as that being really critical, um, but I, I also imagine that you had a, a very keen eye towards the right kind of um, private equity firm that would provide you with the strategic knowledge of getting to that next level, because there's, there's a whole lot you sure. know that goes on with getting um, to that next absolutely, level. Absolutely, because I don't know everything, right? So, yeah. and, and our team doesn't know everything. And so they're, they're experts in growth patterns and, and, uh, and doing things, but they listen to us as well. So mm-hmm. it's a blended, it's a blended uh, approach. But uh, you know, we, we employed an intermediary. So we, em- okay. we employed a, a, a banker, okay. right? So an investment banker that knows and knew players in in the field of you know sort of what we ranged in and where where we sit okay um and was this someone who you knew locally or did you have to go find this this is a national national person but we've had we had experience with them before uh and so uh but we did form our team right so we had a deal attorney Mm -hmm. and i say deal attorney meaning that they have to be versed in mergers acquisition Mm -hmm. deals Mm -hmm. uh, because there are definite structures and you want, you want, uh, I've dealt, I've dealt with attorneys that are deal makers and deal killers. And so, Oh, me too. So, (laughs) so because, right. Because you can have, you can have, uh, you can have people that don't understand that there, yes, there's risk. We just need to manage through the risk. And if you have an attorney that, that really wants to eliminate risk, then there's no deal. Correct. So you can't. You, it, it doesn't fall that way. It has to be somebody that that understands the the mitigating things, but also understands there's a give and take in this process. Yeah. So I, then, I want to stop for one second mm-hmm. there because I think this is such a critical part. And really, this is anytime you're hiring an attorney. Absolutely. Um, and being a recovering attorney, I've uh, I've been on both <laughs> sides, right? But making sure when you hire your attorney that they understand the business purpose for the deal, I think is so critical because sometimes the attorneys get in and they get so protective and they are so concerned about, you know, getting it done right. And, and the fear of risk, you know, can, can really overtake and they will do things that in, in their mind is exactly what needs to be done to protect their client. But it's not always a just about protecting the client. It's about getting the deal done. So making sure that your lawyer, no matter what you're hiring them for, really understands the business purpose. As an example, the business purpose is we need to get this deal done and we need to mitigate risk everywhere we can, but we need to get this deal done. Right. Yeah, Correct. really critical. And so you have, you have a, a deal attorney, you have your investment banker, and then we had our accounting firm. Mm-hmm. And so they all worked together for looking at, tax advantages, for looking at legal issues, for looking at all those things as we got into the deal. Right. And so, so that's, that's, you know, that's the, that's the mechanics of that side of it. And the team that you pulled together, so you had this investment banker who you had worked with in the past right, or some of your them, team yep. had, um, and they weren't local. Did, did they help to form the team? So did you bring in attorneys who that investment banker already knew, or did you use your own counsel locally? I used a counsel that I was familiar with actually out of Boca Raton that, okay. that uh, was a very, very experienced on both the buy side and sell side for okay. private equity. So you really so I went I went for an expert uh, that was uh, high, you know, high in the, in the, expertise area mm-hmm. it's very specific to these deals okay. uh, because I wanted you just wanted you want the best if you're going through it you want mm-hmm. the best and someone with the uh, creative and understood it and has seen you know been there done that right. I didn't want to I didn't want to plow any new ground on this 
And the, the accountants that you run in the CPA firm, was They're that local. your existing mm -hmm. firm? Okay. That's our so, you, so, so the CPA firm you kept, right. you brought in the attorneys, you right. brought in the intermediary, intermediary who was the investment right. banker. Right. Now, if there's somebody out there who is really thinking about this as a potential strategy for them, what advice mm -hmm. would you give on how to find an investment banker who's perfect for you if you don't already know that person? Yeah, and that's, you know, that, that's not the easiest thing, but you have to start asking a lot of questions. And, and I would say not, depending on the size of the business, you know, there, are, there certainly are business brokers mm -hmm. uh, around, uh, but at, at a certain size and a certain direction that you're going, uh, you need to get an investment banker that understands the PE world and mm -hmm. strategic world and things like that. Mm -hmm. Typically, um, industries have associations. So if you happen to be in an industry that has an association, a lot of times those associations have information that can direct you to people that deal that are industry that specific. are industry okay. specific in that That's a intermediary. Good point. good point. So, uh, and that, and you also brought up another good point, which is uh, how do you know whether to go down the path of working with a business broker or working with an investment banker? Is that something that um, that you would recommend people look at both options, or are they such different strategies? that if you're really looking more towards the recapitalization, just right. bringing some cash in, you're always that, that going to be you working to head, as an investment yeah, banker. That you really have to head in that direction. Okay. If you're looking just to, you know, I have a small shop and I just want to sell it, mm -hmm. um, I, I would imagine business that broker. business broker could, you know, would have contacts uh, uh, of people that were local to that community if it was just a one-off type mm -hmm. of thing. If it's a larger company, I think you're going to need a little more expertise on that. And by the way, Not everything true. that Theo has shared so far about the pre-work, and look, we haven't even we haven't even touched on all of that pre-work yet, but at least the getting your house in order financially mm -hmm. and administratively, um, that all applies whether you're going the route of recapitalization totally. or if you're gonna if you're looking to sell. Um, I can tell you the most recent statistics that I've heard on businesses that are put up for sale is that eight out of 10 businesses that are put up for sale don't sell. And the reason typically to start off with is the fact that they don't have that stuff in order and that the business is all up here in the entre entrepreneur's head and is there aren't systems and processes and financials in place that would allow someone to evaluate the business in a way that they would need to to make that kind of investment. So I um, just, just wanted to make that note. Now, I would, I would also point out if, if if anybody's interested, they should read the book, The E-Myth. By Michael Gerber. Right. So yes. read The E-Myth because it talks about how to franchise your business. Mm -hmm. That should be your goal is there should be a playbook that if I walked in, I could take the playbook and understand how to run that business. Yeah. It's like taking the business from here and putting it onto paper so that yeah. the new business owner actually has something to work from rather than just your word, right? Correct. So that becomes Correct. really important. And, and you know, when we talk about timing, three to five years, you should be thinking out at least as you're developing this succession plan. I would also suggest if you're not exactly sure when you want to exit the business, there are some people who are so in love with their business. Absolutely. They're like, I don't really want to leave. Correct. But it doesn't matter. So, so my point is, you get these things in place right now, you start taking your effort and energy as owner and putting them into getting those systems and processes in place, work on the business versus in the business, because the beautiful thing is, let's say three to five years out, you don't feel like leaving. Well, guess what? You still have a house that's in order and you have the choice. And I think this is really powerful, the choice whether to go or not to go, right? right? There's freedom I also in that. Think, I also think people underestimate the fact that at any time you can have a health event. Correct. Oh, you have an un, you know, you, you have a forced change. It's nice to have unforced change uh -huh. so that you can be in charge of that. Yeah. But occasionally, what would happen? There's a curveball, mm -hmm. and you have a forced change. Yeah. And when you have a forced change, certainly helpful to anybody that has to deal with the business. You know, if, if you happen to pass away. Or if you are incapacitated and not being able to be contributory to the to the business, 
they have to be able to pick up the pieces. Yeah. So yeah, the sooner plan. it's sooner it's in order and the better, it's just a better life planning situation. Altogether. Mm-hmm. Stress is reduced, Correct. vacations are lengthened. Correct. Everything's good. Correct. Right. Correct. Um all right, talk to us a little bit about the other pieces of this um succession planning. So I, I'm gonna call it succession planning. Right. It, it I think is all part part of of this recapitalization recapitalization is making sure that you've got these leaders lined up and not, not just lined up, but ready to go. And I don't know, I don't know why this is so often missed other than people just get really busy, right? They get busy and they, and and I, I, I have found in the, in the past when I've spoken to people, they just didn't see the need to, uh, put others in place because they really didn't want to, they didn't want to have to pay a salary. They didn't want to have to pay somebody Mm -hmm. to do this. And short term thinking it is Mm -hmm. because if you really are, if you're destined to grow, if that's your goal to grow your organization and keep it vibrant and, and up to speed, you know, part of the, part of the thing that, that leads to that succession and leads to the development of leaders is your ability to delegate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you have to be able to delegate and I didn't do that well at first mm-hmm. and and you run into it's uh, you can you can grow a company to a seat of the pants size and for each company that's a little different but you get sort of you know the first three four million dollars you can kind of do seat of the pants stuff and not have a lot of policies and procedures but then things start to fall through the cracks yeah and you quickly realize wait a minute we're we're going to implode here if we don't start getting people in the places to really be the gatekeepers in this area of the business. Right. And so we, we, we did that early on and we have in, in our, um, you know, in, in our organization now we have managers of all our departments, but under them we have a protege for that person. Mm. And we invest in the education of those people and the mentoring of those people. So I'm a big believer in mentorship and mentoring. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those people have experience. And if anything happened to one of the leaders, yes, it would be a hole, but it would be filled. And then we would work to develop that person beyond where they are now, but they're ready to go in those places. And so that's to us, that's huge as a, as a safety valve. I, and I want to stop and just ask uh, our listeners whether you actually have that strategy in place right now, because if you don't, it's a huge right. opportunity, right, to have those people not only identified, but begin that mentoring process, begin that delegating process, so they're right. actually getting some hands-on experience within that role in the event they need to take it. And quite honestly, if you've got some rock stars that are in that manager role and you've got an opening to move them up, right. you want to make sure that you've got them moved up. So Correct. I, I think that's really powerful. And you know, so, so in our company last year, over the last three years, we averaged 40 promotions internally a year. Wow. Right. Now, so, now you from, talk about a culture. From, you know, so, so we, when, and when we talk about when we, when we have uh, an employee review, which you always hear about, well, let's have the annual review. Let's have an employee review. That The term we use is career development okay. meeting. So oh, I like that. it's a career development meeting. And mm-hmm. so we want to know where they'd like to be, what they'd like to do. And then we work to get them on the path that will allow them to do that. And do you have those meetings scheduled intentionally, like annually, or is those it- are annually? But they can be they can be sped up by the manager okay. uh, as well because of the feedback. And we're constantly getting feedback or seeing the people. I mean, they they touch base with everybody. And if there's a potential opening or something, and they and we know that somebody's interested, then we want to have another meeting with that person and, Got and it. talk to them. I really like that a career development career development meeting versus a Correct. performance review. My gosh, right. performance reviews, we'll talk about those another time, right? <laughs> okay. Um, now, I want to just share something that I think you'll really appreciate mm-hmm. with your background in real estate development sure. early on with Days In. Um, I like to think of a growth company in terms of real estate. When you first build the company, you only need a smaller foundation because it's a smaller structure. Then what happens is these companies grow, grow, grow. You, you picture that structure building. Well, if you don't go back and check that foundation right. and fix and build and grow that foundation, which in business terms is all about systems and processes and procedures, 
If you and haven't gone back to develop those procedures mm -hmm. and develop the people who are running those systems and processes and right. procedures, that's when you have the crumble, right? Correct. Because if it's, if it's solely dependent on one or two people, you really don't have an organization. No. Because no. if something happens to that if person, you lose that person, then then you're in you know you're in a world of hurt. And a really great exercise to go through is do an analysis of your organization. And I want you to look at the different people in the organization. Just ask yourself one by one, what would happen if I lost this person? It's a scare. I know that's a scary exercise. Some people right. just got a little sick to their stomach <laughs> thinking about it. But I mean, it's really powerful to recognize there are going to be at least. A handful. If you if you're not really on top of building and continuing to develop that foundation and your people, um, there are going to be roles out there that if you don't have a plan for them and you lost that person, oh my gosh, it is so devastating Correct. for a business. Okay. Correct. And 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 that's. I mean, when you develop people, I'm all about letting them skin their knees. Mm. You have to let them fail. Why? That's the only way they learn a lesson. Certainly was true with me. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine if there was no failure allowed in business? my toe many, many, many times and yeah. you go, oh, wouldn't, wouldn't do that again. Yeah. I, even to the point that, I, you know, I have people that I've mentored and, and, and they'll say, well, here's what, I, here's what I'm going to do about this situation. They may be repeating something that I tried years ago and it didn't work for me. I say, great. Tell me how that worked. Because there's two, there's two points to that. One, maybe it won't work again. Uh -huh. And yeah, I could have told him that it wouldn't work or her that it wouldn't work, but really better to experience that mm -hmm. and, then, and then try another route and fix it. Or maybe it was me. Maybe I didn't carry out that plan mm -hmm. well, and this person's better suited to do it. Mm -hmm. And maybe they have a twist on it. So I could learn something from this too. Mm -hmm. But you have to let people experience some of the frustrations of not getting it right the first time and then sticking with it. And I know what some people are thinking right people. now, what some people are thinking right now is, but at what cost? So if there's, you know, you've got a manager who comes up with this strategy and you've tried it before and there's a big dollar sign attached Correct. to that, do you still let them go for it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken because, no, like a true entrepreneur. No, because, because, you know, one of, one of the things I would tell you is that, that uh, it has to be proportionate to the responsibility and to, to the decision-making ability, right? right. So, so my number one, people say, well, what's your, you know, what's your number one thing that you're responsible for? The very, very, very first thing is I can't let anyone else drive the stagecoach over the cliff. Right. It can be me. Mm -hmm. Right. But then it's on me. Mm -hmm. And and I work hard not to do that, making sure that we don't do that because we're, I'm responsible. I mean, I am. I do take it personally. I'm responsible for many, many lives that are affected by our employees. Mm -hmm. And so I work hard at that. But I can never delegate something to someone that could really, really risk the company. Okay. So it is proportionate to the to, to the situation and to, to the things. So we will always talk out mm -hmm. large scale strategy implementation, something with a big dollar sign on it. So the higher the risk, the more, more heads are involved in, in making decisions like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, I, I never want to micromanage. I'm not good at micromanage. I don't want to micromanage. Mm -hmm. If I have to do that, then something's very off. That's right. That's right. And that's the delegation side. So tell us a little bit more about how you were able to execute this succession plan where you are now stepping out from CEO, as I right. said, of the airing of this, which right. will actually happen, you know, uh, very soon here. You will become uh, only, you're already chairman of the board, but right. that's going to be your sole role because your president and COO is now taking over as CEO. CEO that is correct. And uh, as I understand, he came to you straight out of high school and has been working with you for years. How did you almost how did twenty-two you years now? Yeah. That? yeah. So uh, he he Tim Dupree is his name, and Tim came to us uh, right out of high school, uh, got into our as an apprentice, mm -hmm. and um, fast forward, he took advantage of every opportunity to move up in the company and learn and. Uh, be mentored by leaders that are in the company and have 
come through the company mm -hmm. uh, and, and took on more and more responsibility and executed it, handled it, uh, never shied away from it and, and has risen to the level that he is. And so, so he's a, he's a, but he's a very respected person because he's grown throughout the entire organization. So I think there may be a lot of people listening out there who are thinking about whether or not they're going to take that path to ultimately take over as president or CEO of their organization. And one of the things to really consider is um, what Theo just shared about Tim and, and his mindset going after more responsibility. I can't tell you how many times right. uh, we've come across leaders who are shying away from taking on additional responsibility because it's not in their job description. Right. So, so I'm just going to make that point of if, if you're one of those who's really on this career path and you're interested in the ultimate mm -hmm. you know, senior leadership roles that are available, are you seeking that opportunity constantly? Are you seeking that, mem that mentorship are you even willing to move through different departments? Did he actually move oh, through yes. different departments? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think we can and took on leadership lives. roles, right? So, mm -hmm. so he's he's been he's been our, our uh, he's he's been a uh, leader in a department, but he's also been a branch manager up in Sarasota. Uh, so he's had full responsibility. He's, I mean, we, you know, he's taken on all these things. This is not something that, that I just woke up one day and said, okay, I'm tired of being CEO, toss it to you, see you later. Yeah. This, that's, not, that's not it at all. This has been in the works. This has been, he has been doing the role. So this is so really important too. Delegating, he has been doing it. So he has earned the title, not the title first. Right. And then see if he can earn the, the, the role. This right. Is, he has proven himself. And so, so how long, how, how long had he actually taken over some of the actual duties? How long has he been actually doing that? So we've CEO been working duties? at this almost three years. Okay, so three years. For so there's three a patience, years. there's a patience process in this, right? So absolutely. Because, but it's, you know, I, I, I read somewhere or somebody told me you can't microwave a, a gourmet meal. And, and I believe yeah. that, <laughs> well, let's define gourmet. Yeah. So, um, but it, you know, it doesn't come in the 60 seconds, quickly. right? Yeah. So you, it takes time to marinate. It takes time to, to grow that person and allowing them to take on more and more and more responsibility bit by bit by bit by bit. And, and that's, I would never want to set someone up to fail. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think that's, I, leaders should develop leaders. Well, to develop leaders, you have to set them up for success. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything you do has to be with the thought of, is this too much on someone's plate? Is this, you know, is the right time? Mm -hmm. So it's a timing thing. It's, a, it's an education thing. It's a feedback thing. It's, it's all that. So, you, you, you know, it's exposure. Yeah. It's exposure. Yeah. And Theo, last show, we talked about the fact that we are in the fastest paced business environment, right? Change is coming at us so quickly. Yes. So there are, there are CEOs and presidents out there right now who are thinking like, oh, that's awesome that you had the luxury of having three years time to really develop this individual, but I'm at breakneck speed just trying to keep up with my duties. And my next in line is so busy operationally, like how do we even make sense of that? So clearly there has to be a plan in place. There has to be a very intentional growth path. Yes. How did you manage through that? The, you know, part of that is you, you actually have to front load your leadership team. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, if you get behind the, the curve, mm -hmm. if you get behind the curve, uh, it, it's really hard to get back up on top, mm -hmm. really hard. Because you are, you're scrambling through the business the side. The operational side, yeah. And, you, you know, how am I going to insert somebody in here and teach them? Because they, they just got to jump on the treadmill here. I mean, mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't have time to teach. I got to, I'm putting out fires over here. And what you find mm -hmm. is you, you start, you end up putting out fires because things are falling through the crack, because you don't have the people in place, because the processes aren't there. Mm -hmm. And so it's a vicious cycle on that side. But you do have to. Be disciplined enough to stop and say, if I don't pull somebody in, we're going down. 
Mm-hmm. Or I'm going to go stay crazy. on the treadmill. Right. I'm just, you right? know, I'm, 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 I'm yeah, I mean, it's going to drive me nuts. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't, I can't do it. So, and so you have to, you have to, to be disciplined enough to do that and get somebody that's up to speed, you know, get them up to speed as quickly as possible, delegate as quick as you can, proportionate to their capacity to understand and take some things off the plate so that you gain on that. But you're going to end up putting some people in place based on your assumption mm-hmm. of future growth. So this, I think this is right? real, really critical. So, so there's, there's two pieces as I see it. One is being really strategic about the staffing, right? Mm-hmm. If you know that you are going to execute a succession plan over the next three to five years, right. it requires number two, an investment, a larger Correct. investment in your senior leadership team because you have to create some space. Right. Because if you're not creating, so maybe this is, this is what's been happening in a lot of cases. You know, I, I made the Mm -hmm. comment, like, how can people not be developing their leaders? Well, I'm very clear why they're not because they're so busy. Um, But why are they so busy? They haven't made that space. So I think that's what I'm hearing from you. You very intentionally created space and you staffed yourself appropriately where you had the time to invest in the mentorship and the development and the delegation to, to Tim. Correct. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when we, a part of our business is seasonal, mm-hmm. being in air conditioning, so mm-hmm. heat of the summer, we ramp up and, you know, more things happen a lot of times. Our, our operation, nothing changes in our operation except the volume. Okay. Okay. So we, the processes Full don't staffing. change. Staffing okay. is the same. Uh, processes stay the same. The biggest thing that you have to worry about uh, when you get busy are people taking shortcuts from the process that works Mm -hmm. because they think they feel like sometimes they're too busy to follow the process and that's when things fall apart. So process when you're slow, process when you're fast, Mm -hmm. growing, whatever. I mean, that's you, if you do it and it's working, it's just, it's just a volume thing then. It. It's just the speed. The, the mm-hmm. process works. So, well, but it is an investment. You, clearly, it, it's it's strategy. It's investment. It's it's the whole. It's the whole. Um, the whole pie, right? right. Uh, Theo, you've given so many really, really powerful nuggets through last episode and this episode. Thank you. And what I'd like to ask you is sort of the the catch all question. If there's if there's one thing that you could share from your experience in your leadership uh, mm-hmm. throughout your career, um, one thing you could share with the listeners, what would that be? Uh, I, th- I really think that um, leaders have to be intentional. They have to be humble. They have to know that it's not a solo flight. They have to surround themselves with smarter people. That's not a secret. People ask me, what's my secret? And I go on well, there. I have no secret. I look for people that are way smarter than me. Mm-hmm. I, I put them in a place that allows them to flourish and grow to be the best person they can be doing what they love to do. And it raises the entire organization. Surround yourself with great people. I mean, if you, know, you go back to my gourmet meal, if you're going to make a gourmet meal, you got to start with great ingredients. Yeah. And so, you, you, you know, invest it's a people business out there no matter what business you're in it's a people business it's either people internally or it's people that you're dealing with in the in the consumer side or whatever whoever you're selling to and and they're buying from you Mm -hmm. um it's a people business invest in the people well theo you have clearly clearly made huge investments in all of your people to be able to create the kind of organization that you've created and it will be fun to continue to watch the growth (laughs) with you you know as as chairman of the board and and watching your team continue to flourish. So I appreciate your time. I've been talking with Theo Etzel, who is author of Invest Your Heart Beats Wisely. So if you Mm -hmm. haven't picked this up yet, please do. You can also find him at theoetzel.com. We'll include some of his information on the show notes so that you can refer back. Um, And I just really think that for those who are listening, who are in that place and really thinking about either a, you know, a, a recapitalization, if they're thinking about a succession plan, you've given so many good nuggets. So good. thanks so much for tuning in. And if you Thank know you. somebody who's at that stage where they're really looking to either 
massively grow and they need some capital or if they're looking to exit in the next three to five years or even longer, this might be a great episode to share with them. So thanks for tuning in to the Evolve to Win show produced in partnership with Gulf Shore Business Magazine.